Let's go to the Lord again in prayer, and then we'll open our Bibles, if you haven't already, to the book of Titus, and there to chapter 1. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you that in ages past, before the world even existed, in your great glory and sovereignty, and that eternal intertrinitarian relationship, there existed a plan to display your great glory through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And in that death, procure a people who were sinners to yourself, forgiving them of their sin. In all of this, you displayed your goodness. You displayed your justice, your power, your righteousness, and many other aspects of your various powerful, eternal attributes. Thank you. The Lord in heaven, we know that even those two small words, thank you, compared to all that you are and have done in and through Christ and are yet to do, are but small words, but they come from hearts that you have changed. The Lord in heaven, they ascribe to you glory and majesty. For indeed, you have had mercy. We pray this morning that you would bless us with wisdom as we consider the truth of the eternality of your plan to save and to display your glory. I pray that this truth enrich our minds and our hearts and our lives, that in days to come we meditate on the reality of it and the impact of it in our own day-to-day -day living. Give us wisdom now. In Jesus' name, amen. We are continuing in the light of the fact that today is Palm Sunday, and next Sunday is Easter Sunday, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. In the light of those two things, we are taking a break from our study in the book of Ephesians, that sixth chapter concerning the armor of God, and we'll be examining this morning the truth that... God's eternal plan is indeed the plan that drives this temporal world today. And I'm going to ask you to begin with me this morning in the book of Titus, chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading from the ESV, and you can follow along in the bulletin if you don't have the ESV translation because the ESV actually translates this text and conveys very clearly that what is in view is something that was taking place before creation ever began. Look at verse 1 with me. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Whenever we speak of the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
we understand by the revelation of the Word of God alone that we are addressing the elements of a plan that was formulated in eternity past. We are examining the essence of something that was established before time even began. God's Word clearly shows us that Christ's death and His resurrection were planned in eternity past, and that they are indeed the central elements to the fulfillment of God's eternal plan of redemption, and that what He has accomplished in that redemption, He is working out now in the lives of His people to the praise of His goodness and His glory. We're going to spend multiple uh, or time this morning looking at multiple verses um, dealing with the eternality of the plan of God. We need to understand that this plan of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world and giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross to God was something that was set up long before time came. It existed prior to the foundation of the world, and since it existed prior to the foundation of the world, or prior to creation, it existed before time itself in eternity past. Take a look with me in your Bibles, first of all, to the book of Acts, and there to the second chapter. Peter, speaking to the crowd that had gathered around him at Pentecost, Whenever the time came for the fulfillment of Pentecost, he was preaching God's word, the gospel of Christ, and he said to the people in Acts 2.22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. That little phrase there, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, speaks to the fact that they knew, or that Peter knew, and that they should know, those to whom he was speaking, that what they had witnessed in the execution of Christ was in all actuality the execution of God's predetermined plan. What they saw in time and what they witnessed in time was the evidence that God had a plan before time began. Look to chapter 4, where the same truth is conveyed. And again, here stressed various other elements involved with the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. For truly, in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. All of the events and all of the people immediately involved and some indirectly involved in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ were all elements of God's predetermined plan. Look to the book of Revelation with me, chapter 13, and there to verse 8. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, the text is speaking about directly those who are worshiping the beast or the Antichrist or will worship the beast. And the text says, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb, who has been slain. Other translations 
speak of this verse indicating Christ being slain from before the foundation of the earth. And again, alluding to God's plan, which he executed in time, the death and resurrection of our Savior. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, a text that we are familiar with, having gone through a study in that section of Scripture now, speaks to us that God has chosen his people in Christ from before the foundation of the world. Look at Second Timothy with me. And there, chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. We read Titus 1, 1 and 2. Look at Romans with me. Chapter 8. 29. Speaking of the fact that God works all things together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose, Paul then writes in verse 29 and says, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. And you can see clearly in this text from the word predestined, there is that by that word conveyed, an eternal purpose, something that had occurred in eternity past. They were predestined. It was predetermined. And those then that he had predestined, he executed an event in time and he called them. Notice the text. And those whom he called, he justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now that glorified is something that's yet to take place in the future, but we must understand that glorified is linked to the word predestined there in that verse just as much as justified is and called is. And so our glorification was something that God had established in eternity past, and he did so in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Notice that they are chosen and that according to the foreknowledge of God. As Ephesians 1.11 that we, or 1, four, which we mentioned a moment ago, chosen in eternity past, before time began, before the foundation of the world. We can say that at its core, the creation, including all of the events of creation, represent the execution of God's eternal plan as He works all things, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, after the counsel of His will. And for this reason, listen closely, every mark of time, whether it's a division in seconds or minutes or hours, days, weeks, months, years, seasons, decades, millennial, however you want to break that up. And all the events that occur in time, those events that we consider spectacular, great, great, 
world-changing events all constitute aspects of God's eternal plan. What a great praise and blessing that is. We're not living in a world that is filled with nothing but capricious incidences. That should bring great comfort to our hearts and minds. Instead, we are living in a world that all the events that transpire are events that are contained within the sovereign work of a God who is good and holy and just. I'm going to take a few moments and you can follow along with me there in your bulletin to acknowledge a few other verses, and there are many more even than these that speak to the fact that God has an eternal plan that He has and is working out in the creation. Notice Luke 22, verse 22, For indeed, and this is Jesus speaking, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In the Old Testament, the Bible spoke of the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is acknowledging that here. And He is acknowledging that it has been determined. And that determination was something that occurred in eternity past. Romans chapter 9, verse 22, What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath, and notice this, prepared for destruction. Again, serving God's eternal plan. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the Word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Second Peter 2.9 Peter, after he's written about various judgments of God and the deliverance of the righteous, he says, drawing this conclusion, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. God knows how to execute His plan, and it will not fail. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. For he, that is Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Notice the little phrase there. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, speaking of the eternal being of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we come this morning to the triumphal entry of our Lord into Jerusalem, we need to recognize that all of those events that transpire constitute God's working out of His eternal plan. Many of those events Sometimes, right down to small details, were events that were prophesied in the Old Testament. The very entrance itself of Christ into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, as we read this morning, was prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And in those prophecies, what we are seeing are elements of God's plan communicated to the creation. Before it was communicated to the creation, we wouldn't have known it. And what we behold in those prophecies, again, are elements of the plan revealed. 
And whenever we see the fulfillment of those prophecies, what we are beholding is the execution of the plan and its fulfillment. So what we can say this morning, specifically referring to the triumphal entry and the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were all prophesied, and sometimes various details of them in the Old Testament. And those prophecies serve to remind us that God has an eternal plan. I want to spend some time this morning over the next few minutes looking at some of the events that transpired in that week between the triumphal entry of our Lord into Jerusalem and the resurrection itself. I've given you a handout, and you can see in that handout that week was a very busy week for our Lord. On Palm Sunday, the Bible reveals to us that Jesus entered Jerusalem with his disciples. That's communicated to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the Gospels communicate his entrance. Now, the Bible in Mark chapter 11, verse 11, informs us that whenever Christ on that first Sunday came into Jerusalem, he arrived in Jerusalem with his disciples late in the day. So the text there in Mark 11, verse 11 says that Jesus went into the temple, he looked around, and then he left. And he went out to Bethany. From the following day to the night of his betrayal, Jesus preached every day in the temple at Jerusalem. And in the evening, he would return to the Mount of Olives where he and his disciples would spend the night. During this week, as Jesus at various times would return in the morning to the temple, he drove out the money changers from the temple, he taught the people daily, and he preached the gospel, all of these things in the temple. He pronounced woes on the scribes and Pharisees. You remember that in Matthew 23, 1 through 36. And also, as he was on the Mount of Olives, he gave us the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. And it was in that Olivet Discourse, you'll recall, that he spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem and of his second coming of the last days. And those days we are waiting for yet. And Jesus celebrated, as you know, on the very night of his betrayal, the Passover. And it was on that same night that he instituted the Lord's Supper in the upper room. Then immediately following the Lord's Supper, Jesus taught the disciples, not Judas, about his departure to heaven and how he would send the Holy Spirit to guide them into all the truth. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 14, verse 17, you'll remember that Jesus said to the disciples that the Helper would come, and he would be with you and in you. Now that's very important. We often look over that quickly, but it's actually a fulfillment of the book of Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 27, or Isaiah, excuse me, 36, 27, where God talks about putting his Holy Spirit within us. I'm going to ask you to turn to that text for just a moment with me. And actually, it's not Isaiah, but Ezekiel 36 and 27. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And whenever Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit in John 14 and verse 17, coming and being not only with the disciples, but in them, he was communicating that to them in the context of them also walking in obedience to his word. So here we can see, again, one of those elements of the fulfillment of prophecy, one that's often not noticed. 
but certainly evident there in John 14, 17. Jesus, as you know, also prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was betrayed in that garden. And Psalm 41, verse 9 speaks of his betrayal. Between his betrayal and his crucifixion, we understand from the Gospels that Jesus himself endured six different trials. Six different trials. And this is very interesting, especially here in just a moment. The fact that he endured six trials and was found innocent. But unjustly sentenced. He was tried first, according to John 18, by Annas, one of the high priests. He was tried by Caiaphas, also a high priest. Then he was tried by the Sanhedrin, a Jewish council. Then by Pilate. And then by Herod. Pilate sent him to Herod. And then Herod, not finding anything he was guilty of, sent him back to Pilate, who tried him again six different times. Jesus was unjustly condemned, beaten, and crucified. Take a look with me, if you will, at Matthew 26. Notice the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or excuse me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all careful to communicate to us that Jesus was not guilty. Matthew 26, go with me, or I should say Matthew uh, and Luke are careful to communicate this unjust trial of Christ or conviction of Christ. Matthew 26, and there to verse 59. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward, but later on two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And you remember that he spoke in that context of his body. He was speaking of his death and his resurrection. Chapter 27, Matthew 27, 22. Pilate said to them, as Pilate speaking to the people, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting, all the more saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. What Pilate was doing was confirming, I haven't found anything wrong with him. There is no just reason for him to be executed. And he even had Christ beat, not for the sake of, of Christ being guilty of anything, but to appease the people. Pilate said, his blood shall be on your children. Then he released Barabbas to them, or for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Luke chapter 23 and verse 13. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, 
nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release them to them at the feast, one prisoner. But they cried all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. Look down to verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now listen to the other thief. But the other answered, rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Even the thief recognized the innocence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we rightly conclude that he was unjustly condemned, beaten, crucified. And his body was placed, as you are aware, in the tomb. His death prophesied in many verses in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is considered the first reference to his death, where it speaks there of the serpent bruising his heel. And that again, revelation of the plan of God. Isaiah 53 and numerous other texts, Psalm 22, all speak to Christ's death. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, quoted also in Acts chapter 2, speak to the resurrection of our Lord. On the third day, he was resurrected from the grave. And after being resurrected, as you are aware from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he showed himself to Peter and to the other disciples, to more than 500 brethren at one time. And last of all, Paul says, as to one born out of due time, he showed himself to me. It's a busy week for our Lord. All of it culminating in his death and resurrection, and there God's great and eternal plan executed to the praise of his goodness and his glory. In the book of Psalms, chapter 139, David, considering the great knowledge of God concerning just his own being, and really, in its context, the execution of God's eternal plan in his own life. David understood that God was working something from eternity past in his own life through the various promises that he was given concerning ultimately many of those in reference to Christ. He made this proclamation and he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. You know, whenever we consider the fact that God right now is at work in the lives of his people, carrying out this incredible eternal plan, that every aspect of our lives are foreordained from before the foundation of the world and all the events of our lives. It's mind-boggling. It's incredibly incomprehensible to us. The fact that God has determined our time and he's determined our boundaries according to Acts chapter 17 and how all of that works together to the praise of His goodness and glory, and how it all works together in our practical, everyday living is just more than we can comprehend. It's impossible. 
Now that doesn't mean that there aren't aspects of it that we are to comprehend, because there are. And God has clearly revealed those to us in His Word. And in those things we are to walk obediently, mindfully aware of them, purposely pursuing holiness to the praise of His goodness and His glory. But all the other things that He brings into our lives, both those things that are considered by us good and those things that are considered by us as bad, we don't know what they all are, and it's impossible for us to comprehend them. But we do know, according to multiple verses that we have examined this morning, especially there in Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30, God is working them all together for good. They're falling in accord perfectly with His eternal plan. Furthermore, and according to our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, not only do we lack the ability to comprehend these things, but we are also not given the permission to know them. And this is important for us. Look in Acts with me for a moment. So many set their minds on trying to understand and find out the details of God's plan that are outside of His Word that He hasn't revealed, and they miss the very evident things that He has revealed. We're not to pursue what we do not know that is not revealed to us, I should say, concerning our lives in Scripture, but really what is what it is that God has revealed for us to know and to do. In Acts chapter 1, our Lord Jesus Christ, after His resurrection from the grave, spoke to the disciples for 40 days. During that 40-day period, according to verse 3, He was teaching them the things concerning the kingdom of of God. From the Old Testament, as well as from Christ's recent instruction during these 40 days concerning the kingdom of God, his disciples properly understood that one element of the kingdom of God entailed the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. What the disciples asked, basically, was a very natural question. They lacked a specific point of information. They had no doubt that the restoration to Israel would come. It was clearly prophesied in the Old Testament. Christ clearly must have conveyed it to them during that 40-day period. But what they wanted to know was the timing. So they asked the question, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Verse 6. And listen, just as naturally as that question was, Jesus answered the question. They were sincere and reasonable in their request, and Jesus was sincere in his response. But I want you to note first that Christ in his answer, he didn't rebuke their question as if their premise for asking the question was wrong. In other words, Jesus didn't respond to them and rebuke them because they had some drawn some wrong conclusion concerning the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. He didn't say, look, I've been teaching you guys for three and a half years. I've spent the last 40 days after the resurrection communicating to you that there's not going to be a restoration of Israel. 
Haven't you got it yet? Don't you get it? You know, I would have thrown in something like knuckleheads, hard-headed. Where have you been? What is going on? He didn't respond that way to them. It would have not been unnatural for Christ to have said something to them like, O oh, ye of little faith, or haven't you been listening? Have I been so long with you in teaching you that you don't know this now? He didn't respond that way. Furthermore, not only did he not rebuke them, but he didn't correct them either. He didn't say something like, well, you know, you're right a little bit, but you need to tweak this up a little bit here. You see, I've already restored it. You see, you are the restoration. And the Gentiles will become Israel, and that will constitute the restoration. He didn't do that. Notice his response to them. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know the times. It's not for you to know the epochs. Those two words, times and epochs, translate the Greek words chronos, and karyos. Kronos is a Greek word that refers to time. It can refer to a specific time. It can refer to a duration of time. Karyos is a Greek word that refers to events that occur within time. So what Jesus was saying to them is that there are some specific times, and there are some specific events in time that you don't know and that you're not going to know because God has fixed them. Notice he's fixed them. They're in accord with his plan. They're certain they're going to occur. It's not that they won't occur. They are going to occur. They will happen. But you don't know the time they're going to happen. And not only do you not know the time that they're going to happen, you're not even necessarily going to know about all of the events that are going to transpire leading up to that particular event. You see, they understood there was a restoration to come. They knew that. They could look in the pages of the Old Testament and they could see God's promises spread out through the Old Testament to Israel. Just as they could look in the Old Testament and they could see God's promises concerning the coming of the Messiah, both the first coming and the second coming. But they couldn't discern the very specific times. They could get close. And they certainly couldn't understand all of the incredible events that would transpire that would lead up to His coming and be instrumental in it. You remember Peter at the betrayal of Christ. Peter had been told very specifically just hours before they entered Jerusalem that Jesus would go into Jerusalem. Jesus told him this himself. He would be betrayed. He'd be handed over to the Gentiles and he would be crucified. And what's Peter doing? Lord, I'll fight for you. I'll give my life for you. And he proved that out. His statement was true. He was speaking genuine and sincerely because there in the garden at the betrayal of Christ and a whole army of Roman soldiers, a Roman cohort in front of him, Peter, one of just 12 guys, including Christ, pulled out his sword and hacked off a guy's ear. Now, a cohort was a multitude of 
of heavily armed Roman soldiers. Peter, you'd have been better off if you'd have fought them with the fishing pole because that was your life career. He wasn't a swordsman like these guys were trained in military endeavors. But it didn't matter to him. He was going to give his life. But then you know what happened. Christ told him to put away his sword. And then he was betrayed. Christ was betrayed. And Peter, he was trying to figure out all the things that were going on. How is this working out? You remember he was out there watching Christ and he could see Christ being tried by the Sanhedrin and he saw things going south quick. And they were asking him, you were with him. And he denied it. And he cursed and denied it. He was adamant. Peter was confused. He wasn't understanding all of those events that were coming together like that. We don't always either understand the specifics. We don't have the ability to comprehend the incomprehensible workings of God. And we don't even have God's permission to enter into those things. You know, men and women are consistently trying to find out what's going to take place. They they even, as the Old Testament says, they do the stupidest things to find that out. In the Old Testament, God asked the question, should a man consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consider the foolishness of that for a moment. People trying to get in contact with the dead to find out the future. I mean, if you're going to talk to anybody about the future, shouldn't you at least talk to those that are alive now and not those that are dead and gone? For one, you can't even talk to them. But that's the foolishness of it. What we are to do is to heed the Word of God. We're to be mindful of the very things that God has spoken to us. Since we don't have the ability, nor do we have the permission, we are to be content as God's people with that which God has revealed in His truth concerning His plan. And we should wait and watch patiently for its fulfillment. As the Lord continues to this very moment the execution of his eternal plan and that through the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look in your bulletins with me to Acts chapter 3. It's at your bulletin, very last paragraph. I've quoted there in that text Acts chapter 3 verse 18. This is Peter's second sermon after the Pentecost. First there was That sermon recorded in Acts 2 to the Jews, and then in Acts 3, a second sermon to the Jews. And he says to them there this, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Remember the prophecies? Those were the revelations of God's plan. Peter is saying, He announced it, and then he said, he executed it. He goes on and he says, Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped out, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive, until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. As clearly as God spoke, the elements of his plan concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as an infant, he also has spoken about his second coming. It's another message, but I'm always amazed how much world celebration transpires 
concerning the first coming of Christ at and around Christmas. But no one celebrates the second coming of Christ, the one yet to come. And I think perhaps the reason being is whenever Christ comes the second time, He doesn't come for sins. He's not coming executing mercy, but He's coming executing justice. To render to those who hate God and are against Him the just penalty for their enmity. That's not something generally celebrated but for His people, for His people. It is, according to Revelation, a transformation where they will be resurrected, many of them, and others will be brought with Him. And after He reigns on the earth for a thousand years, we will enter all of His people together into His glorious presence for eternity. Also, a fulfillment of God's eternal plan. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. You ever wonder sometimes or ask yourself, as you consider the different things we hear in the news and see in our world around us, Lord, what's it all about? What is going on in this place? Well, God has a plan. And He's accomplishing it. We don't always understand the timing of it. We don't always understand the events involved in it. They're not given to us in Scripture. Not all of them. We're called, though, as His people to remain faithful to Him in the midst of it to the praise of His goodness and glory. And to those, He says, who overcome, they will be rewarded. There is a blessing that awaits His people in eternity. Not just a blessing, but many. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, thank You that while we look around the world and we see various events transpiring that cause us to wonder what is going on, we know, as your people, that these things are all being accomplished within your sovereign will and purpose. Thank you for the comfort that that brings. Lord, in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the twists and the turns that we encounter in this life, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the leadership of your Holy Spirit calls us to run with patience the race set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. In his name we pray. Amen.